We are recording. Welcome to the weekly in web browsers and GUI team sync up. Um, coming to you live from all around the world. Um, someone has a lot of background noise. Um, you are all mute if you're not talking. Thank you. No worries. Um, okay. So, as is customary, uh, there is an agenda. We've been filling it out. I'm going to share my screen and maybe we'll just have a quick check. Uh, so we'll start with a round of uh, updates and demos from what you've done last week. Uh, then I'm going to introduce quickly a little design resource that I'm working on for GUI team ideas. Uh, to I won't explain it now. Uh, we should do a quick check-in mid-quarter OKR check-in, uh, and we should talk about Forstem highlights. But first, in order of appearance, Enrique can't be with us, so very quickly, uh, Enrique has been working on Spectron tests for IPFS desktop. So uh, there are some gnarly edge cases around um, starting up IPFS desktop and do you have an existing repo? Was that repo shut down cleanly or not? Like, is there a lock file in it? Anyway, we've got some code that's checking for various situations uh, when desktop starts to try and make that as robust as possible. Um, but previously there was no tests for it, which was bad. Um, so now we have a test. We have a test that checks like no existing repo, existing repo, uh, existing repo, and lock file, um, which is a big improvement. Um, much more to do on the testing of IPFS desktop, but at least we have now the pattern of how to do it and how to also run the tests on uh, OS X and Linux and Windows. Um, auto update procedure there's been some changes to how desktop downloads updates. Previously, it would wait till you quit the app to. Um, download download updates and reinstall them and that's obviously not ideal for a taskbar app that's intended to just sit and be running forever so uh, it now quietly goes and downloads uh, newer versions of the desktop app when uh, it checks every few minutes and then when it finds them it goes and downloads uh, and then we'll prompt you when the download is completed successfully that there is now locally on your machine a newer version of the app that you could install so then you get a notification and you opt in and it will stop the IPFS daemon, stop the IPFS desktop, and then update your, update your install to the latest version. So that is a big improvement. Uh, and then some other smaller changes, like fixing the uh, context menu and things like that. Um, apparently, he is not blocked on anything. And, and he'd like us to take a stab at checking whether on OS X we can drop files right on the taskbar, which is kind of cool. Um, okay, that was my report for Enrique Lytle. Do you want to go next? What was your highlights from last week? Uh, mostly for them. <laughs> Let me share my screen. Uh, yep. Uh, yeah, so like the highlight was for them. Uh, our meetups, IPFS meetups were was great. Thank you. For I was going to say, like the item in the agenda is we should take a moment to unpack for people who weren't there what was particularly good about Fosdem, so we can cycle back to. So oh, perfect. perfect. Then I quickly go over uh, remaining stuff. Uh, so it was a short week, uh, but I started uh, exciting development in the way we translate our uh, applications. Uh, there's an issue when I sort of unpacked uh, upcoming uh, native integration between TransFX, which is crowdsourcing uh, service we use for uh, sourcing translations from IPFS community and GitHub, which we use for code. And uh, uh, ideally, we will have full automation for both publishing new strings to uh, TransFX and also when the language is 100% uh, translated, TransFX will open a PR to the specific project with that specific language. So that way we will no longer have the situation when language is ready, 100% translated, but it sort of hangs in the limbo until there's a release or um, repository maintainer uh, gets a notification to uh, make a synchronized uh, string. So hopefully we'll get access to this new feature soon and I plan to test it on the IPFS uh, Explorer repository. And ideally if that goes well, uh, will uh, probably enable it everywhere. If there's a better place to test it, 
I'm all ears, but I feel that's a, a small enough uh, place to start. Uh, yeah, and uh, I provided some feedback uh, uh, on the Proto School uh, around files tutorials, mostly like uh, prior, yeah, uh, pr like prior discussions and some code samples I had uh, around uh, remembered uh, where, where they are and uh, had some uh, secret meeting with browser vendor this week and also uh, uh, started prototyping uh, change to make it possible for IPFS companion to opt out from redirect per website. Similarly, when you are visiting a website and you want to disable uh, ad blocking only for that specific website, uh, we want to do the same for companion just to and like make sure people don't disable extension because it breaks one specific website. Uh, it should uh, improve uh, stuff for people. Uh, so yeah, I'm not blocked on anything, but if uh, you are blocked because of me, let me know. I have a small backlog uh, I need to go through. And next week I want to like finish this opt-out service and start adding uploads to MFS because we have a very nice web UI, but our browser extension, if you right click on image or uh, just quickly upload it using uh, the alt interface, it won't add files to MFS to the files in web UI. So we finally should make sure those files are added to MFS. Uh, and that's, uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Any quick questions for Yadel? Yeah, can I ask about the trans effects? Like how does it decide that you're done with a certain language? Is it like oh, at least yeah. one person has volunteered enough strings to cover the language? Oh, or do yeah. people have agreed that the translation is valid or is there any QA? Uh, okay, so just uh, in short, is that uh, translation is a finite set of strings. So it's like, let's let's say there's a hundred strings to translate. Uh, ideally, I think it will be possible to decide uh, when the pull request is created. It will be created either when you hit the one hundred percent strings being translated, or there's also a you can have two set uh, two different roles in your translation team. You can have regular translators and reviewers, and only reviewer can mark specific string as reviewed. So there's like a like quality control, and you can uh, probably will be able to uh, set uh, that pull request is only created when all strings are reviewed. Uh, we'll probably start with just this uh, first option when the 100% strings is translated, just to, so that uh, um, uh, strings are get populated to our repository. When like our translation teams will grow and we'll have more than one or three people uh, and like dedicated reviewer ideally to, uh, then we we'll probably switch to uh, like a higher quality control. We could probably do a specific different settings for different languages. Uh, I did not see the UI on the TransEffect side for this uh, feature, but, uh, expect updates on the issue I linked. And there's no one employed here whose job is translation, right? This is all just like community volunteers that do it. Yeah, so far, yeah. Okay, if there's no more questions, then we will jump on to highlights from Diogo. How's it going? Hello. Hello. So, uh, highlights from last week. Well, basically, I, I uh, worked on UI stuff, and I'll show you what I worked on. So, basically, we had a problem when we fetched uh, a directory with many files that the UI hanged, and there was no indication to the user of what was happening. Uh, everyone thought everything was crashing, but no. So. I made a small animation like those cards from YouTube. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. When you start, when you're in a, on YouTube and the videos aren't loading, basically you have an animation, a card-like animation, something like this. You guys could see that. This was uh, fast to load because I have opened it many times. Let me take another thing. Yeah, no, everything is super fast in my computer. <laughs> so, um, 
I'll probably just. Show. I was I was having to test it by uh, going into the React tools and like toggling the state on the file list. Yeah, but yeah, but, but no, but we changed the logic, so we we can't do that right now. I think that's okay. Yeah, but your GIF yeah. shows it off real good. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm trying to. Basically, there's an animation that uh, is a, puts a small opacity on the file list, and it has like this swipe showing that something is happening. Yeah, that's it. Uh, apart from that, yeah, I refactored the. the I'm going to do this. I then a bit of user testing with the guys from Oxy to see if they they knew what was happening in the file browser. So this is the the version that's the, the production version of the web UI. And this is the new one. We're talking about the add, add file dropdown, add files and fall. Basically, um, I think we we know how this works because we implemented it and and are using it. But every every person I talked to, they didn't understand the difference of this add folder and this new folder. What happened is this creates a new folder, just a blank folder with nothing inside, and this adds a folder. But with everyone I talked, everyone thought that this was adding a file and this was creating an empty folder instead of adding a folder with files, the files there. And other thing, this add by path, this name doesn't help because basically this uh, is to put a CID. So it's to import something that is already on IPFS to our file browser. And a person who doesn't know, it has no clue what's happening with this. So my refactor was I, I saw how Google Drive and Dropbox was making. For example, Dropbox doesn't have a dropdown but has a lot of uh, choices. But the icons help a lot because we can see that this is a flow, this is a new folder. And Drive, it's like we had. We, you can create a new folder or you can upload st uh, stuff. So basically, my refactor was to, to join these two. And now we have a new folder here. So you can just create a new folder. And now the add drop, the add, uh, I changed this name because add to IPFS, I don't think this is 100% uh, correct because we're, we're adding to our repo. So I just put the add here. And inside you, you can add files, add folders, and this from IPFS because I think it's clearer that you can add something from IPFS. So this, like, this is super simple, but I, it had some thought around it. I had to see what was the best choice. And I think it's it's good for now. Uh, yeah. Then I played. To, I uh, did some small fixes to the UI of the selected actions. I'm not going to show that because it was just uh, little things. Right now, this is still a work in progress. I'm refactoring this list to use React Virtualize uh, to to disable the lag, basically, because when we're listing too many files. It's, uh, it's a bit slow. So like we're doing in the Pierce page, we have this table that just only renders what's visible on the screen. We're going to use this logic in the files uh, page. Uh, there's, there's a question from Terry. Yeah. Yeah, so back where you were showing the refactor and where you add by path, like yeah. add from IPFS, the description yeah. inside it still says add by path. Are you planning to change that to CID? Or do people genuinely yeah, know that that's what it means? That was the question I had, I, I had because um, we can put a CID, or I, I think we can put an IPNS path too. I'm not 100% sure, but I think that works. I think probably IPFS address is perhaps the least ambiguous. Okay. I mean, yeah. if, it, like, the thing you said that had an or in it is the thing I would choose. Like, add an IPNS path or a CID or whatever. Like, whatever's the thing that, in the context of the way they usually interact with it. If, so, if, if someone's new and they don't know which concepts are connected to each other, personally. It, yeah, it, might, it might not be terrible to just put, 
like two examples on that yes. modal that's like this kind of thing or this kind of thing. I love that idea. Okay, yeah, make it more explicit. All right. Thank you. So, so next week I'm going to push to the to the next version of the web UI. Basically, it's just listing uh, the files with the React virtualized. We have to always has to to continue not to finish the Countly instance, the analytics. And I think that's it. And I want to start looking at the OPRs because we had the check-in and I still haven't started working on any of them. So I have to take care of that. Any questions? I think this loosely falls under our OKRs. We're improving web UI. And that is vital. Yeah. A uh, question from Alan. Oh, a really quick question on the, so I saw you've got the new folder, pulled it out of the menu. Did, I wasn't 100% um, clear, is that, does that do the same thing as the thing that's in the drop down menu? Oh, oh no, 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 no. The, uh, it doesn't? No, it doesn't. And, and I did this to basically, so people wouldn't have that doubt. But okay. I think it's not working then. <laughs> so <laughs> what happens, this new folder just creates a new empty An folder. empty folder, yeah. Yeah, here. And then what, so adding a folder in there? Having, adding a folder. Oh, ah, yeah, I see. I get it. Yeah, you're, you're adding a folder with files. Yeah, okay, I get it. The thing that was happening is this, these options, the two of them with the same icon, they, people wouldn't understand. I think this way is clearer. I thought of putting this uh, creates new empty folder, but the text is, is too much text. I don't like it. If you if you were gonna have them both in the same place, you could have the one that has files in it have like pictures of little pieces of paper sticking out of the folder. Yeah, I thought. Uh, I'm not suggesting this is the best option, but if you were gonna do it with pictures. Yeah, it would help a lot if we had like a plus on these icons. But, uh, we haven't got those kind of icons. We we can compose two icons. We can do it. Yeah, yeah, but still, I think it's a better option to have the new folder outside because inside oh. of the drop down, it's just to add to IPFS, add anything. I think I think no one is against the change you have made. I think it's definitely an improvement. Maybe in the interim, you could say folder of files. I know it's quite verbose, but it's obvious. Yeah. Sure. Are you intentionally avoiding using the word upload because for technical people this is some giant lie? Yeah, yeah. Okay. upload is not is simply not correct. Mm. It's risky. Very sad. It is sad. You're right. Yeah. But it, uh, how about, it's how would you feel about import? That's better. Are there any like normal human used words or I mean, add. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, that's why it's uh, for example, on this case, I was going to put import from IPFS, but I prefer to, to just don't use import and just from IPFS because it's we're adding from IPFS. Alan Shaw is respectfully know. raising a hand. The the reason that they're separate file and folder is because of some technical reason, right? Oh no, he's gone there. Yeah, yeah it's the sadness yeah. of. Uh, it's, you can't have a dialogue where you can select a single file or a. Uh, something like that. Why have you got to poke the wound again? <laughs> <laughs> like it, it would be nice if we just had add file that would just allow us to select a folder if we wanted. Wouldn't it but be? Yeah. That's the that's the ideal. And this is why we have trouble. This is the web platform. Don't worry about it. It's getting better every day. Um, uh, as a reminder, Dropbox has this same distinction. Distinction. So I know it's terrible, but there is precedent. Yeah, we have a both files, a both folders. That's the way it is right now. Yeah, I mean, I think that's my issue with add is like add doesn't imply existing to me, whereas import or upload imply that it's a thing that already exists. Interesting. Okay, should we, let's put a pin in this because uh, clearly we could, like the, new, the meaning of words is a topic that means we could talk about it forever, but we, um, Terry, could you drop some thoughts on on a relevant issue that maybe Diogo will link to. Thank you kindly. Um, Jim Pick suggests beam in files, so I'm gonna ask Jim to also comment on an issue. Beam them into the interplanetary file system. Uh, wait, 
Diogo, that's his update, which must mean it, me, hit me, share a screen. Uh, there's lots of faces that you can't see that I can see and they're distracting. Um, this thing, uh, I did some work on the analytics stuff. Um, it was initially, the change that's happened to the analytics is A, there is now a bunch of unit tests in them. So I now know it works, which is better than before. And I just assumed it worked. And then I wrote the unit tests and found a bunch of bugs. So that's a recurring story that everyone should take heed of. Uh, and then I also paid attention to the comments that I was getting on the issue that Lidl wrote ages ago. That he was like, if you make this thing opt in, then we'll get almost zero useful analytics. And then you've also got like a self-selecting tiny group of people who deliberately opt into analytics. So it's been refactored. Um, what it does now is it respects your browser's do not track setting. So if your browser, if you've got navigator do not track, enabled, um, then analytics is disabled in web UI. And in that instance, where you've neither explicitly opted in or opted out of analytics, and we are not tracking you, um, there is a call to action added to the status page that you can see here that says, please help. Like, uh, we have anonymized the data in as much as we are not tracking CIDs, we're not tracking personal info, um, we're not tracking file paths within your local repository. Um, we're not tracking which peers you're connected to. It's just like, what browser are you using? And uh, what's the screen size? And what's the operating system? And things that we can use to better direct what, um, what platforms that we test on and stuff like that. So it's uh, telemetry rather than analytics. Um, so this now works and you can enable it. And now I should have analytics enabled. So if I go to my settings page, I can see that I am helping to improve this app by sending anonymous analytics data. And if I open this out, there's now some useful words that tell a user in human language what is happening when this occurs. Uh, the next step with that is I have to write some Terraform to, to make a PR on our info project so that we can run Countly on our own servers so that this telemetry data doesn't go through any third parties. So this is the like the respect your user's privacy, like let's not dump all their interactions with web UI on Google Analytics, let's self-host, self-host this stuff. Uh, so that is all done apart from the infrastructure stuff. So we're currently using a uh, just a digital ocean droplet that I spun up uh, just to test it out. And next step is get it running on our actual IPFS infra. Uh, there's a question. There's something, idea, add a link to the word Cantley in there. Yeah, All right, I'll do that. <laughs> no worries, that is a good idea. Uh, you can shout your questions out, it's fine. Yeah, so people can check what Cantley is. Yeah, of course, that is a good idea. I can link to their privacy policy as well. Um, and Alan's gonna say the same. That is done, let me flip to the dock. Do, do, do. Uh, otherwise, I've been noodling around with IPLD issues. Today has been sucked into, uh, Diogo's done a bunch of good work updating the IPLD Explorer components uh, to use the current version of the IPLD API, not the bleeding edge new version of the IPLD API, but is at least up to date. Uh, but in trying to roll that out to the explore.ipld.io website, there's a bunch of problems and it's not clear what the solution is yet. So I'm gonna keep on packing that. Um, bu, 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 bu. Otherwise, yeah, I've got a solution to the mixed content error. Um, there was just, that was, uh, if you load webui.ipfs.io today, um, it, uh, you get a mixed content loading error as it tries to create a DNS multi-adder out of out of the current location's origin, uh, and it does it completely incorrectly due to the confluence of about four different bugs in four different projects uh, that uh, I spent some time last week fixing. Anyway, uh, that's not very exciting. Uh, we're super close on the 2.4.0 release. Choo, choo, choo! It's so close, mostly because of all the work that Diogo's doing, um, and it being held up on all the work that I haven't done. So I'm gonna get that finished. Um, and what else is exciting? 
do, 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 do. Uh, I'm just in the process of adding a create React app with our JS IPFS example to JS IPFS so that we don't break that again. Because um, we broke it last year and we did a lot of work to make sure that we weren't using any language features in JavaScript that couldn't be easily transpiled by create React app. Uh, we had a bunch of errors a year ago and we fixed them. So I'm going to add in a new demo app to that so that there is something as part of the release process where we just check that things like that still work. <gasps> That's me. Um, next up is Terry Chaplin. And everyone else in the co-working space who you'll enjoy hearing. Um, Fosdem is where I've spent most of my time. The main stuff I've done has not had really anything to do with GUI. I was updating um, documentation for chapter leaders in the organizing repo. So like you can order stickers now, et cetera. Very exciting. Um, so next up, which is really just permanently next up, it feels like, is that file API. And I really appreciate Lytle hopping in there with some um, suggestions and Alan correcting the suggestions and all of this. Um, all of that examples and stuff is very appreciated. I promise I will get to it someday to apply it. Um, and then I will be next week in San Francisco with Portia and Michael doing kind of a community team hack week. And one of the things we know we want to look at regarding Proto School is whether we leave it in Vue or migrate it to ViewPress with some of the key factors being like strangers who haven't used either tool need to use it. Um, and then like whether it's easier to pull text, like text into the components or the components into the text or something like this is my understanding of the basic principle. But if anyone is actually familiar with Vue and ViewPress and has feels, please drop them in the issue before we start messing around with this and making decisions that we may or may not regret. Yeah. Question, question from Alan Shaw. I just wondered what the difference was between Vue and ViewPress. Would anyone more well read like to answer the really question? <laughs> Please, Ollie. Uh, I mean, Vue operates at an equivalent level of React. It is a rendering library. ViewPress operates at an equivalent level of Gatsby. Like, it's a static site generator with whistles and bells on. Um, so it's a static site generator that uses Vue. OK, got it. And it's a modern, progressive web app static site generator, so it's quite you know, it's in the ballpark of one of those. Sounds cool. I think one of the things it would affect is like how the URLs work and how then Google Analytics works with it. So like I postponed the issue about making sure Google Analytics works in Vue because it would work differently with ViewPress than it would with Vue is my impression. So the, the difference is with ViewPress, the URL structure is defined by the framework, um, whereas with Vue, it's entirely up to you. There's nothing, with Vue, you can make good URLs, um, but it's on you to do that. Um, but the, the key difference is it being a static site, like the SEO slash discoverability is improved by the fact that you will have a bunch of web pages instead of one JavaScript bundle. Okay. I think one of the other things that was mentioned in that issue by one of our chapter leaders, and I don't know if this is true or not, is that he thought if we make it a static site, then we could host it on IPFS, which he seemed to be implying that the it's not true that you can do that with you. Does that sound accurate to people? Uh, I think it is already hosted on my PFS, and you could do it with both. Um, but static sites work nicely on on IPFS. That is true. You need to watch out for relative URLs. We had a bunch of problems with Gatsby. We needed to actually do a Gatsby plugin. Uh, it works kind of weirdly, but it works. <laughs> Straightforward. This is going to be the call where we. T t this is the call where we touch all my triggering issues. So, uh, relative URLs in static sites. Uh, very few of the modern static site builders. In fact, none of them. Uh, anything with a client-side router does a terrible job of relative URLs. So URLs that are relative to the current location. Um, if you want your site to be viewable, both mounted under slash IPFS CID or mounted on the root of a domain. Uh, that's the problem. I've just spent a good half hour chatting to Chris about that the other day. Uh, and I've kind of gone around every yeah, 
yeah, every JavaScript static site builder and open like either opened or commented on an existing issue. It's like be great if this supported relative URLs. Here's at least one interesting use case. Um, and the Mox team did great work, uh, at least making a plugin for Gatsby. Um, it's interesting that it's like that only works for IPFS sites. Like there's still like no general purpose relative URL solution for client side JavaScript routing. <sighs> Um, uh, one question for you, Terry, is um, I guess uh, I should probably just comment on the issue, but it's interesting that uh, there's no conversation about should it be in React like the rest of our stuff. Um, I don't wish to demand a monoculture, um, but there is a, sort of, a, a minor maintenance burden added to the team supporting more than one. But I, I don't have strong enough feelings to wade into the argument. It's just interesting that it hasn't even come up. I basically arrived after it was built and wasn't part of the conversations that Michael had or the, I don't know if he had conversations or just built it, I don't know. But um, I don't know the answer to that. And I'm not deep enough into view yet. Like, I mean, I'm gonna have to learn ViewPress or learn React or keep trying learning view so I personally am flexible but I think in general like we need to do something where we can clearly document for people who have not used the framework how to build a tutorial that goes in and have some kind of like easy template pictures arrows where like where the text ends up when you put it in this file whatever it is um, so if somebody wants to start the conversation, that's fine. I just don't have I, any information to participate. I am I'm very happy that you guys are all meeting up in San Francisco and having a hack week. That's going to be super useful. Uh, all right. Any more for Terry? Any more questions? Okay, we're in the second half of the meeting, and we got Alan Shaw and Hugo Vistadias to go. So, Alan Shaw, how's your week been? What's your highlights? Made any more sweet CLI tools? Oh, okay. Wait a second. I'm not prepared. Oh, oh okay. wow. I am. Um, all right. So let's walk through this. Uh, I've got a demo, so that's going to come in a second. So fix four solid errors at the moment. If you if there's an error while you start up the daemon in JS IPFS, then it will swallow it and just exit, and you're left with like what you typed in at the command line and nothing else, and then you're back at the command line again, and that's really annoying. Um, but you can, if you put the debug flag in, you can see that there was actually an error, uh, but it was getting swallowed, so I, I fixed that. Um, and I think that was merged this morning. Uh, and that PR also had like a really, um, like it was good for um, the, for JS IPFS because it simplified the client um, bin file like a lot uh, and it also allowed us to do stuff like um, pipe it like echo some text pipe it to IPFS add and then pipe that to um, to uh, IPFS CID base 32 which is the tool to allow you to just mess around with CIDs and um, change them in this case to base 32 and the prior to this change um, that uh, the second part of that the base 32 thing would fail because IPFS would start up um, and because IPFS, IPFS ad was already running it had a lock on the repo and the second bit of the pipeline tried to get a lock on the repo and would fail and that's really annoying so um, this fixed that by allowing this command the command handlers to instead of getting an IPFS instance automatically they have to request it and so the ones that don't actually use a, a repo or IPFS like the CID tool um, are free to work without causing that error so um, so that's good um, secondly I've made some progress on CID v1 base 32 by default um, in uh, oh, let me just share my screen uh, share 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 uh, I just did that today I did, did, did this today can you see my screen yes yes okay this is the command line oh hang on oh Okay, so uh, you can now do JS IPFS add dash r recursively, and I'm going to add in my pictures folder, um, and that will spit out a whole bunch of stuff. But you'll notice that all of the CIDs that it spits out are baffies, which is super cool, huh? 
Um, so I did that this morning. I've, I've, all I've done is the Unix FS importer, and I've just changed, basically changed the defaults, fixed up the te tests, um, changed the default for the CID library to when you call base encoded string, it will return a um, base32 encoded string. Um, and so I'm moving on to MFS and uh, like all of the rest of the APIs, like objects and, and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, I have put a link on the, uh, hang on, let me just stop sharing because that's the end of my demo. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, I put a link on the, on the notes there for um, the, oh yeah, oh okay. No, I didn't put a link, a proper link. Anyway, uh, there's a, uh, I'll put the link to the issue where you can track all of the PRs that I'm adding to, to do that. Um, so then, uh, as you know from last week, I, I've been working on the Happy 18 a refactor, um, which is done and now merged, um, not re yet released. Um, so that's that's good. That took a while. It's huge, but it is is good because um, the someone reported that Happy 16 has a security vulnerability in one of its modules, so it was timely. Um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, so last week I demoed a really rough version of this thing called IEIM, I'm, um, IPFS Install Manager, and I kind of finished it off a little bit, and, um, uh, and it's kind of it's good. Uh, there's, a, I think, one bug I need to sort out, um, but I, I'm pretty happy with it at the moment. Um, uh, apart from, it doesn't work on Windows, and I talked with uh, Henrique about this, and we came to the conclusion that it was hard to make it work on Windows. <laughs> Um, so there's some work to do there. Anyway, um, I'm not blocked on anything and I'm continuing the CRDV1 base32 by default um, charge, hopefully this week and next. Um, and, and yeah, like, uh, it, you know, I, I feel as though having worked on it today, finally, um, there's like, it's, I don't think it's going to take very long if I actually get the time to do it, really. So we can have it out you know, in, in the next release or the one after perhaps. Um, so it could be very, very soon um, that JS IPFS has this. Um, whether or not we sync that with a Go IPFS release and when that happens is another matter um, which we'll need to sort out. But I think step one is just get it, get it all ready and um, ready to go in PRs uh, and, and then, yeah. That's that. Um, and the other cool news is uh, I was talking to Bashko this morning and he's, um, he's kind of confident that the DHT PR is now um, almost ready to merge. It's just making its way through CI and Jenkins is um, having a bad day as usual. So uh, it's taking some time. That's, That's me. okay. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Uh, Hugo, Mr. Diaz. Uh, Alan, regarding the AIM, do you, yeah. do you, are you uh, using binaries or still using NPM? I'm still using NPM. I, I haven't made any more progress on that. Uh, I was I was just wondering if you messed with the package uh, thingy, and you and if you were able to actually make a binary of uh, JS IPFS. <laughs> but yeah, okay. I didn't know. I I just got it. Like um, I made it a lot better from the point of view of like me and my OCD, like how the code works. Um, and also um, Juan opened a, a whole bunch of issues and, um, and suggestions, which I made some, uh, some improvements with. Um, so it's changed a bit, uh, but it's a lot more stable and a, a lot better than it was. Well, I mean, literally last week when I demoed it, it I just got it working. So um, yeah, um, I think the Swapping out NPM for something else is something I'm going to leave for the future. Um, Pull request welcome. Right now, that works, and that works good enough for me. Um, and it's it's actually really useful to, for me because it, it installs it into a different path and uses its own config and repo. So I can have my, like I normally NPM link my, uh, my JS IPFS. So I, I can have JS IPFS as my usual like development version, but I can also have like IPFS as... Uh, either JS or Go, depending on what I'm, um, what, what I'm using with I'm. So that's that's super useful for me anyway. So even if it doesn't benefit anyone else, I've helped myself. <laughs> Perfect. On um, uh, on what you said about Base32 a while back, we exclaimed Baffy, and it's worth for the users following along at home. Uh, Baffy is our like pet name for the Base32 
uh, CID update project because many of the popular IPLD formats when serialized and give you a CID will start with BAFY. Um, also, that connects to the previous point around our no static site generators build out things with relative links. The whole one of the driving forces around migrating to base 32 is so that we can start to use uh, IPFS CIDs as domains or as subdomains um, so that we, if we can't teach the entire universe of web developers to use relative URLs, then we can just fix it the other way, which is use CIDs everywhere, including in domains. Um, yeah. Uh, Hugo, Mr. Diaz, would you let's go next? Yes. So basically, I was uh, in Belgium attending FOSDA. A bunch of good things happened and came out of it. It was great. And one of, one of, one of those was a really a good uh, chat we had all together about the CI. And David uh, basically just got us to, okay, let's just do it. Uh, so basically, <laughs> that's what what happened. Uh, I was able to get the Travis support to actually migrate our stuff to the .com thing. That's kind of the enterprise stuff. And now we can actually give them money and have our own runners and not be queued. Uh, so basically what I'm doing now is uh, kind of make sure everything works there, at least um, with our current setup. And right now, uh, everything seems to be running okay. So I'm going to need to do a bunch of pull requests to all the repos, maybe some tweaks on Azure to make some stuff uh, better, but not much uh, else is needed to start moving uh, to Travis. What's, uh, the pay what's the payoff, Hugo? Why, why even bother? Has there been some improvement? Bother with what? Has there been some significant improvement, perhaps? Oh, this is a better think? name than Jenkins. Oh, I don't think that's a, that doesn't warrant all the effort. Hugo, what? Is it better? Travis yeah. uh, compared to Jenkins? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> so, so, for, so, so for people who aren't following along with this story, could you just <laughs> speak to, is it better? Oh, yeah. By how much? So our current solution is Jenkins, which is actually works pretty badly. Uh, in oh my! The edited highlights. Is it 10x faster? Is it 2x faster? Oh, if it if it is faster, uh, it probably will not be much faster. Okay. It will be much more stable. Great. And we can actually kind of when we have uh, jobs like timing out randomly, we can just restart that specific job, which is really, really useful. So in that regard, it's faster because you only restart like the Windows runner or the Mac runner instead of restarting the whole pipeline that takes like an hour for the JSIPFS. So if you think about it, it will be much faster at least for us developers that need to do that's like a million times a day. So it's going to be much better. Uh, there's still some stuff that we cannot do the, uh, on Travis that uh, we were thinking about doing it on um, other uh, CIs, like manual jobs to do like um, deployments to NPM and stuff like that, like basically doing the, the, the releases. Um, so we need to still think about it a little bit. Maybe we can find a middle ground, uh, at least for the top level um, uh, repos that take a lot much uh, time to manage that the uh, smaller ones. But we will discuss that next week in London. So everything will be great. Uh, more stuff. Basically, left my back my my backpack in in the Airbnb, so basically I'm no 
like USB cables, no laptop, no nothing. I cannot even re re uh, recharge my smart watch, so no watch to. Uh, but uh, um, uh, Alex was kind enough to bring my backpack with him, so uh, he's waiting for me at London, so Monday I will get all that back. <laughs> now I'm kind of working on an old laptop, half with a uh, half setup of some, of some kind. So, um, and yeah, so what I will be working is basically that, talking with the, the infra, team ne infra team next week, finishing up the Travis PRs, and probably also the bundle size PRs because Jacob finally got some time to uh, work on Mplex and it seems to be going pretty well. So we will probably be able to finish the, the bundle size stuff in the next couple of days. So yeah. That makes Alan happy. very happy. And uh, there's been stuff in the chat about various descriptions of how CI is now better. Um, so everyone is in support of this great endeavor that you have done. Thank you very much, Mr. Diaz. Um, Jim Pick, do you want anything you want to share? Uh, haven't really done any front end stuff. I was doing all distributed tracing this week, but uh, um, has anybody done anything with React hooks? Because I'm going to look at this that upcoming week. Not yet. Not the okay. newest new shiny. But I saw a bunch of hoo ha on Twitter. It's, it's another okay. way to do the same thing. <laughs> okay, I might be messing with that in the upcoming week. So nice. I'll talk about it next week. Yeah, perfect. Um, David Diaz, did you want to add anything? I was just like too excited about the CI being so fast and I wanted to see all of you. <laughs> and so I joined the meeting. Scratch to hear all the updates. Yeah, everything going to build real fast and Hugo made it happen and David said it should happen. <laughs> and that is good. Um, all right, that is a round of updates. We don't have a huge amount of time left for our agenda, so let's get to it. Um, has everybody checked the agenda? Okay, there's nothing in it except the things that I added, so we can get through them pretty quickly. Um, I just um, shared this with the design team weekly call, which happens just before this call every week if you are interested in uh, visual design issues. Um, so things that have been happening in the background is I've been pairing with Portia and Terry on a few different front-end issues, and um, I was responsible for kind of taking Agata's original UI kit for IPFS and turning it into IPFS CSS. And then beyond, so that kind of made, that def took what she had designed and turned it into a set of variables and uh, reusable constructs that we could use across all of our web front ends. But then after that, there's been no real kind of progress on uh, a design system or a guidebook that other people could follow that would help them make their things look more like IPFS things. So I've made a little start uh, while I was recovering from being hit by a car and also in Belgium, I was like, I would like to do some uh, work on this. I was like, you know, as you do, recovery time. Um, so this is gonna turn into a project that I'm gonna check in with people who are in the design channel um, and start to pin down what we think uh, are the building blocks to make good, accessible, clear, coherent user interfaces for IPFS. Um, where it's going to start is uh, with what we've got already. So we have already used tachyons as basically the foundation of our design system. And then we just override a few things to make it look IPFS flavored. Um, so this is going to be that walkthrough and that reference point for people who aren't so deeply involved in uh, front-end development so that they can go oh, like oh, what is the what is the navy color that is the IPFS navy color like these are just simple Questions that cost people a few minutes every day because there's no there's no canonical resource. So uh, That's the thing if you are interested in it, then talk to me and let's make it better Super cool. Um, any questions? I can't see the chat, so just shout them out if you have them. If not, I'm going to flip over to. I literally just said I can't see the chat, so now I'm going to open the chat window. Uh, dotty background. Yes, thanks, Alan. Uh, it, that came out of the conversation uh, previously about what the best type of notebook is uh, dots, squares, lines, 
and uh, obviously dots one. So I made sure to reference that. It's all about the it's all about the end jokes. Uh, what else was on the agenda? Uh, all these things are in the way. Okay, it's good. Uh, ooh, okay, I'll check in. Um, we need to schedule some time to talk about that. So I'm going to contact you out of band out of this call and just say, how's it going? How's our OKRs doing? And we need to then take that to the spreadsheet and just make sure that we update our update with our progress so that we can do a better job of kind of tracking if we are moving in the direction we thought we were moving. Um, all right, we've got five minutes left. Fostem highlights. Pow, pow, pow. Who hasn't? Um, some of us went to Fostem and it was really great. Uh, just to like set the tone of this, um, like. Uh, I went to a couple of great talks. There was an open source design track, which I think I don't remember seeing that at a previous FOSDEM. So that was like progress. Um, so they got a whole day of people talking about designing for open source. And one of those things was a great talk from a person called Erin who works at the localization lab. And what they do is they use things like TransFX, uh, services like TransFX, which you may have heard of from the way that we do translations. Um, to collaborate on localization for technical projects that have some benefit to privacy, security on the web, um, things like open source projects that are supporting like human decency and freedom and ethics on the web. What they do is they help they help you produce better translations by workshopping things. Um, where you've got a very technical term, like say pluggable transports was the example she gave, and my ears were like, pluggable transports? That's the kind of phrase that we might have to translate in IPFS world. Uh, and she, she made points around like how uh, you really need to factor in, it's not just a question of like straight one-to-one -one translate all the words, which we kind of have a sense of like, translation is never that simple, but also like thinking about things how like, if you're talking about privacy in your product, that, uh, in cultures like in, in Thailand, uh, the word privacy is very like translates more closely to the word like secrecy and has overtones of like you have something to hide. Not it's it's not presented as like a right in in a culture where you generally are more public about more things. Like it's not trivial to translate the word privacy because you can end up suggesting that you're you're seeking to hide things that you are embarrassed around not like I am engaging my right as a human um, so this organization helps you basically come up with better translations for your product so I'd like to be following up with her and help it, seeing if we can get uh, IPFS is it was like music to my ears when she said like there's two ways that we do it and one of them is through TransFX so I was like yes go Lidl like we made the right choice um, so I'm pretty excited about that as you might be able to tell uh, and yep, I got to hear a talk from the UX team at Tor, uh, but I won't go on too much longer. Um, Lidl, did you want to? Did you want to talk about this one, the project fluent? Uh, just like a quick uh, putting a pin on the board that uh, Mozilla um, uh, in the Mozilla room during FOSDEM, uh, there was a talk about how they do did and do localization currently. And uh, one of recent developments is uh, Project Fluent. It's basically a, a, a framework for creating uh, translations uh, in Mozilla products. Uh, products. Uh, it's compatible with ICU standard, which we picked as uh, the potentially future-proof choice. So that's another good decision on our end. And uh, I feel they, they are rapidly iterating and we should follow uh, development of this project and I hope eventually it will grow uh, big enough and robust enough so we can replace the current I-18 next libraries which are sort of like maintained by a commercial entity and there's like a package attached to that. Uh, I feel this one may be a safer choice in the long run. I think if um, uh, I have less concerns of that and more like trying to write the ICU format uh, values in the JSON objects in our translation locales is really fiddly. So if Fluent 
makes that easier if I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel uh, they already ad started addressing things that are not that well handled in uh, I-18 Next. So I probably, if I find some free time, I will be starting evaluating it, maybe introduce it somewhere. Nice. Yeah. Um, that is time. Is there any final quick questions or statements anyone wants to add? If no, I'm not hearing anyone, then that has been the weekly IPFS in web browsers and GUI team sync up. See you same time, same place next week. Thanks very much. Um, bye. <laughs> hey, Lydell. <laughs>